Hi JRPG fans and welcome to the second game in the A Shining Retrospective series. 1992 or 93 in the West saw the release of Sonic Software Planning's second game, Shining Force. This was a massive departure from the previous game, Shining in the Darkness, gameplay wise, changing genre from first person dungeon crawler to strategy or tactical RPG, however you want to call it. This sequel was once again going to suffer budget concerns under Sega as they allotted, again, limited funding to the game. But even with the budget issues, Takahashi, once again taking the lead, was unperturbed and went out to make a game that he'd always wanted to create. The original idea for the game came to Hiroyuki Takahashi during his time at Enix, where the team had been asked to come up with concepts for a strategy game. So for research, Takahashi played many PC strategy games and looked at other console counterparts like Fire Emblem. Fire Emblem specifically, uh, many believe was the inspiration, but Takahashi didn't actually like the game and was quoted saying this, the tempo of the game was so bad it wasn't something I ever wanted to play. But in fact, from the Japanese side of gaming, he took inspiration from an obscure title called Silver Ghost. And for the story perspective, the Dragon Quest game was what provided Takahashi. Um, he said, a dramatic tale of tears and romance with a rich world and setting. Shining Force truly started to take shape near the end of the development cycle for Shining in the Darkness when Takahashi started to properly plan Sonic Software Planning's next title, which he originally envisaged was going to be a Game Gear title. This was a period of time he decided it was time to create a strategy game, but it had to adhere to one strict rule, and that was the enemy terms had to be quick. This led Takahashi and his team to develop a novel AI system to speed it up, thinking along the with this, he wanted the interaction with the enemies to be as quick as well. It seems this desire for speed caused problems with, with Takahashi stating, actually, the whole development nearly fell apart because of the fight scenes. So, we can't deny though that Shining Force's unique and cinematic fight scenes really set it apart from its contemporaries, but to create these took some serious memory management. To go alongside the mechanics, Takahashi decided to make Shining Force a prequel of sorts to the first game, and the world which he had already started to flesh out beyond what we'll see in The Shining in the Darkness. A lot of his inspiration coming from the likes of King Arthur, probably where a particular character's name came from, Lord of the Rings, Conan stories, and even sci-fi books such as Edgar Rice Burroughs' Martian series, as Takahashi was a massive fan of the more science fantasy novels when he was younger. All this led to a strategy game like no other, Shining Force, a game that would leave a legacy with great intention. Anyway, it's time to move on to the story, and as usual, if you want to avoid any spoilers, please jump to the time code on the screen for a gameplay breakdown and my final thoughts. You've been warned, so now, on to the story. In the ages long forgotten, light and darkness fought a war. Heading the forces of darkness was Dark Dragon, and leading the forces of light were the Ancients, who used said powers of light to cast this dark being into another dimension. Dark Dragon vowed that he would return in 1,000 years, and thus the land of Rune had a near millennium of peace, until the kingdom of Runefaus brought war once more. While monsters ravage the lands, the bastions of good do their best to hold out in these dark days, awaiting the return of the Hero of Light, and a young girl asked us if we are willing to step forth and stop the return of Dark Dragon. Chapter 1. Runefaust Invasion we open to our hero Max, an amnesiac warrior that's been living in the land of Guardiana for the last year after he was found on the beach. Taken in by the centaur Varius, the most powerful knight in the land, he is currently training his swordplay with Varius, but a messenger from the classroom rushes in asking for the centaur to follow him. So being curious soul, Max and his friend Lo head to the castle to see what is going on, while ignoring the scorn and jealousy of the local knights who are frustrated at how he's getting special training under their idol. At the castle, the king informs Max that the forces of Runefaust are at the gates of the Ancients, a gate sealed by the Ancients and guarded by the warriors of the Guardiana, even while not knowing what is behind it. Gathering his friends, the advisor Nova, Max heads to the gate, but upon getting there, the force find a small force of Runefaust trying to pry the gate open, so Max and friends step forward to stop the dark force of Runefaust, but little did they know that this force was but a small vanguard for a much larger force led by Lord Kane that attacked Guardiana. The Shining Force rushed back to find a town in ruins, but fortunately most of the townfolk survived, 
But in the castle, Cain has stolen Guardiana's treasure and is battling Lord Varius. Max arrives just in time to see Cain unleash the power of the Sword of Darkness, slaying Varius and mortally wounding the king before teleporting away. The king, in his dying breath, tells us to find the key to the Gate of Ancients before Runefaust does. So the force head off to Alteron, a city in the north, to meet the king there in hopes of finding help for Guardiana. But Max finds the town that feels wrong. The populace are a little out of sorts and seem a bit too happy considering that Runefaust was just outside its walls, along with a strange fortune teller that tells us that we'll soon die if we head north. When meeting the king, he offers to help take us downstairs to discuss his plans, but waiting below is Cain. At the hands of betrayal, Max and Force is thrown in jail for the sake of Alvarone. Not long after being thrown into jail, Chris, a local, breaks us out and helps Max. And we have to fight once more, but fortunately Cain is called away before the battle, so he just must face his lowly forces. Saving Alvarone, everyone is suddenly a lot more motivated, and the king apologises, revealing a secret passage under the castle, allowing us to the force to leave secretly, thus end in chapter one. Chapter two. On the tale of Cain, the force finds itself in Rindo, a town preparing for a circus. But the force discovers that Runefaust forces have set sail, taking almost all the boat, bar the one owned by the mayor, who isn't willing to give it to us. So Max heads north to Manorina to speak to the sage called Otterund, in hopes of finding another way. Fighting their way to Manorina, Max discovers a town full of wizards who mistook him for Runefaust, hence the battle. After some strange antics involving being turned into a chicken, Max finds Henri, the king of Guardiana's daughter, and heir to the throne. She doesn't know or believe everything Max tells her, until Nova appears to clear up the confusion. After some deliberation, she joins the force to avenge her father, and we discover from Otron that below Manorina is a pool of ancients, but first we must get the Orb of Light from the Cavern of Darkness that's next to it. So, off the battle is, Max and the Force once more defeat their enemy. With the orb in hand, Max meets the spirit who tells us that the sealed secret of the Ancients is an evil being that Dark Soul is attempting to unlock, and we must stop him. Back to Otrin, we are declared the Heroes of Light, the Shining Force, and we must chase Cain to the Eastern Continent. Back in Rindo, we discover that the Mayor's grandson is missing. This is the chance to get him to lead lend us the boat, so after some investigation, Shining Force heads into the recently set up circus tent. In the tent, we find the fortune teller, and she sends her evil marionettes to attack us. After destroying these creeps, the mayor's grandson runs out of hiding and back home. The mayor is thrilled, so he gives us his ship, but alas, it's not going to plan. As soon as Max steps on the ship, Miss Creepy Fortune Teller appears again and burns the boat to ash. So this leaves only one option, head to Shade Abbey. Outside of Shade Abbey is a birdman that asks for help rescuing his brother. Going into the abbey to search for the missing birdman, the force discovers that it's filled with very confused, very strange people with a lot of empty graves. But quickly the birdman is found and Max approaches Balbaroy, shouts a warning, but the priest changes into Dark Soul and unleashes a force of undead. The shining force rush in to rescue Max and prepare for a desperate battle. After they've cleansed this once chapel of light, of its darkness, thus ends the second chapter as the force heads to Bustock. Chapter 3 Arriving at Bustock, the force find yet another town in despair, as all the men have been dragged to the local quarry, this mountainside town, along with the local warrior Zylo, a wolfman, that's been fed something that's driven him crazy. Runefaust is trying to dig up an ancient weapon in the quarry, and as the force arrive, they just have succeeded. So the force rushed into action, destroying the remnant forces at the quarry, and finding an item needed to cure Zylo, who joins up. Rushing from Bustock, they head north once more to the bridge heading east, but as soon as they find themselves facing an ancient weapon, the Laser Eye, which after yet another bitter battle they destroy, not allowing Rufus to have this powerful weapon. That's in Chapter 3. Chapter 4. After crossing the bridge, the Force find themselves in the travelling town of Pau, and waiting for them is the general of Runefaust, called Elliot, who declares that he will meet us on the field of battle, even if he disagrees with the path that Runefaust has taken since Dark Soul appeared. And thus, as Pai sets off, the Force must face Elliot on, on the prairie. When defeated, Elliot asks you to save King Grabladu and Runefaust, that was once called Praetoria, from Dark Soul's clutches. Pai returns after the battle, 
we discover the central knight Ernest has disappeared and has rushed off to the castle of Urban Batal in an attempt to kill yet another room vice general, Bulbazak. The force finds the tiring Ernest who joins up to take down Bulbazak, who is at the dock with his ship. So to battle the force goes, defeating yet another general of Runefaust. Bulbazak cowardly tries to ask for mercy by offering you his ship, but Dark Soul is having none of this, and ends the cowardly traitor, mocking Max, insinuating he won't survive the sea. Chapter 5 Dark Soul's words ring true, and the force is ambushed at sea. During the fight, the ship is damaged. Unfortunately, Shell, a mermaid of Worrell, is nearby, and happy that you got rid of the monsters, brings the shining force to Worrell to get the ship repaired. At Worrell, the Force finds a paradise town with a hidden secret. An area is blocked off from everyone, but Max Big Max, he goes to have a look anyway. And the little boat he uses is smashed by rapids. Rescued by a priest that has also gone missing, they find that the ring reef is meant to be a large pool, but it's entirely missing its water, and something is at the bottom. The priest believes this has something to do with the Shining Path, a path that leads to a place called Metaphor. Metaphor being the land of ancients itself. So into the shrine the force goes, but inside they find monsters of Room House waiting for them, trying to open the way. But Max stops them once more, and the door of the at the door, the spirit from the pool once again calls to Max, saying she used the mermaid to bring him here, and by using the shining path they can find the key to the accursed door, the one which Dark Dragon is behind. But as they go to open the gate, Room House Mage uses the last of his power to steal the way forward. The frustrated spirit informs Max that two items are required to open the accursed door. The key, which we've been searching for, and the manual of the seal, which is in the land of the dragons, Dragonia. And these must be found before Dark Soul gets his grubby mitts on them. So we need to go to Prompt, another place with a shining path. Fling the crumbling shrine at the rising water level, the force goes back to Worrell to collect the now repaired boat. Leaving for Prompt, the force is once again attacked at sea, but this time the helm is destroyed. Now adrift at sea, the shining force is facing a crisis. Chapter 6 The Force find themselves adrift in Rudo, a city almost entirely run by children. After talking to Karen, the de facto leader of the children, we discover that nearby is the land of dragons. Dragonia! What a surprise! As something is happening there, it sounds like there is only one sacred dragon left, and it's a youngster. So at the behest of the children, the Force head to Dragonia, find themselves once again one step behind Rune Faust and Kane. Dragonia is almost entirely empty town, apart from a shop, Boken, who appears everywhere, and a single scared dragon, Blue. Blue at first wants nothing to do with anything, but with some encouragement from Karen, her being attacked, and, uh, you know, being disappointed, Blue finds his courage and joins the force, but waiting outside is Kane. Finally, we get to take our revenge for Marius. Defeating Kane, we destroy the mask he's wearing, discover that it is used by Dark Soul. Control Kane. Regression's previous actions. He helps Max unlock the door to the shrine in Tragonia, but Dark Soul is waiting, having obtained the manual and already having the key, he's ready to free Dark Dragon. So, in an attempt at redemption, Kane chucks back down through and attacks Dark Soul. After an explosion, both Kane and Dark Soul disappear. Heading back to Rudo, Karen informs us that prompt our original location is to the south, but we are blocked once again. This time by Michelle, the strange fortune teller that we met long ago. She sets her minions on the force, awaiting Max at the Demon Castle if they can stop them, if they can't stop him. After destroying the forces, Nova informs Vax that he believes that Michelle has the sword of light, which may be useful. So into the castle we go for a showdown with and vengeance for the circus and the boat burning. Destroying this powerful wizardess and reclaiming the sword of light, the force hurry to prompt. Chapter seven. In prompt, the force find an old town with a small broken tower that Max is told is a castle. Investigating this ruin, they find a massive underground castle. The denizens of this castle seem to be unwilling to help, to the extent that King Cusco throws Max into the dungeon, thinking he is a spy. But good old Balkan unlocks this, informing us that he's going to settle in Worrell. Good for him. Walking back to the king, he tells Max that the forces he set to the Tower of Ancients have been destroyed by Dark Souls forces. Leaving the king, Max finds a heavily injured Kane, who convinces the king to let Max go to the tower. So off to the tower the force goes. The route to the tower, the tower itself, full of Dark Souls minions, which once again the Shining Force prove themselves to be nigh unstoppable, smashing the enemy and entering the tower proper. Near the top, Max finds Aleph and Tarasu, defeated by Dark Soul, 
who was once again one step ahead of them, and they started to race the Castle of Ancients, but in an attempt to slow him down, Cain attacks Dark Soul once more, this time falling, a redeemed hero. Back in prop, Max tells the Panic King, but Otterand appears telling us of a chance to stop Dark Dragon using the Chaos Breaker, a sword that requires the Sword of Light that Michelle had, and the Sword of Darkness that Cain has left with King Cusco. So down to the bottom of the castle, the Force go, opening the way to Metaphor to receive Chaos Breaker. Through the door, we meet the spirit once more, who knows that Dark Soul has found the key as well as the manual. She gets Adam, a robot guardian, to help us open the way to Chaos Breaker, but his brother robot Chaos has become corrected and attacks the Shining Force. Destroying the crazy robot and his followers, placing the Sword of Light and the Sword of Darkness on their respective stands, the mighty sword Chaos Breaker was created. Max is ready for the final battle now. Going back to Otterant, she tells us that we must head to Runefaust and meet Mahato. King Cusco tells us that as well as Guardiana holding the Door of Ancients, Runefaust, once called Protectoria, also holds such a door. This is what Dark Soul will use to free Dark Dragon, so Max needs to fight his way into Runefaust. Chapter 8 Finally, in enemy territory of Runefaust, the Force finds something unexpected. The people and the guards are all willing to help as they despise Dark Soul and what he's done to their people and the kink. In a smaller castle, we find Mahato, who lets us enter the castle proper, asking us to stop King Ramladu and destroy Dark Soul. In the castle, it's Dark Soul. Once again, he runs off like the coward that he is, leaving the force at the mercy of the corrupted king, Ramladu. Who, upon defeat, we find suffered a similar fate to Kay, being controlled by Dark Soul. We ask Max to save everyone. It over appears, he has found a secret passage to the gate of ancients that Dark Soul used. So, off the force go but Dark Soul has already sealed the gate behind him. Max unleashes the power of Chaos Breaker, raising the Castle of Ancients and unsealing the door. But upon going through the door, they find an ancient techno monster called Colossus waiting for them. So to battle the Force Go, proving that whether it's ancient technology or not, that it's no match for their power. And now finally the Force is face to face with Dark Soul. He proves surprisingly easy to defeat before he dies, though, he uses all of his power to awaken the ancient Dark Dragon, but even this monster proved to be no match for the combined powers of the Shining Force. Upon Dark Dragon's defeat, a problem occurs. The monstrosity refuses to die, so Nova shouts to Max to stab him with Chaos Breaker and uses its power to seal him. As Max does, the castle starts to sink. Max can't let get himself free of the sword, so to save his friends, he uses the power of regress one last time, saving his friends who refuse to believe that he's gone. As the tower sinks back into the sea once more, Max is left to be the eternal guardian of the castle. After the battle, the Force return, return home, and Bree becomes Queen of Guardiana, and Max is believed to be lost. But we know this is not the case. Max and Adam, the robot, are teleported far away for more adventures on another day. Gameplay Shining Force is a very different game to its predecessor, Shining in the Darkness, no longer being a first person dungeon crawler but now a strategy RPG, or a tactical turn-based RPG, depending on your predilection for naming. But what does this mean? Well, that's what this section is for. But first we'll look at the first of the two modes of game, Town Exploration. The Town Exploration section are one of the things that sets Shining Force apart from its contemporaries at the time, as many of the other popular SRPGs just didn't do this. They tended towards battle, talking, battle. But what we have is on offer here is a chance to wander through the maps of the game talking to the residents and looking for shiny loot or even hidden characters this section of gameplay is where most of the story is found and in most cases you'll need to find the right people to talk to to progress the story but it also contains many people or even bookcases that offer extra tidbits of lore and information to expand on the world it also allows you to use the shops found in various towns and most importantly access our base which we can organize our army using the tactician nova as well we can as we can only take 12 people into battle at a time. But if you find all the characters, you'll have many, many more than this. Now, to interact with everything in the town mode, we see the returning four box menu system first seen in Shining in the Darkness. I found myself spending a lot of time organizing the party in items, such as each character only has four item slots. So if you come across a chest and Max already has four items, he ain't picking it up. A small quality of life feature that will be sorted in later games. So there's a lot of moving items around, and in Shining Force 1, any weapon or rings you have equipped use up one of those four slots. So, uh, again, something we see 
change to a better system in later games. So if we take the Centaur Knights as an example, they can have a Lance for close combat, Spear for ranged combat, and a Ring, meaning that they only have one slot left for another item. Um, we also have to use this menu system every time you want to search or talk to someone, as at this point it doesn't have the like the ability to automatically choose the correct action like you might see in later games. Like if you walk up to someone and just click A or whatever, it'll just talk to them. In this you have to open the menu first. Uh, again, this is something we see in a lot of older RPGs. Uh, it's a little quality of life feature that will see various resolutions in later games. But overall, the menu system again is simple and very solid affair as it was in Shining in the Darkness. The last option available to you in town is the good old shrine, which is very similar to what we saw in Shining in the Darkness. A place to save, your status effects, and raise the dead. It has one very extra important option, and that is promotion. You can promote to a more powerful class once you've hit level 10. Um, many people wait till level 20 for maximum, maximum min-maxing. The advantages are that the stat boosts on each level tend to be much higher, um, meaning you'll grow more powerful very quickly and access more powerful weapons. Uh, there is one downside though that just after you promote your stats reduce. So if you say had 20 attack it's now 15. Um, so that's something to be aware of so you might not want to like promote everyone at the same time. You'll find very soon that all your stats outstrip your previous class's strength. Uh, now, on to the meat and potatoes of the game, the battles. Battles see your chosen 12 appear on the map with a bunch of enemies in a similar style to Final Fantasy, tactics, fire emblem, disguise, etc. Since this is a turn based strategy game. But as you'll see, while the concept is similar, similar to the aforementioned, it does have some elements that make it very shining force. The first is turn order. In this game, it's based on characters' agility with a random element thrown in. So it could be one of your little dudes or the enemy that moves first and then wins repeat it could be either or you don't know the movement itself is based on a grid based system as we've seen in many of these games in this one it chooses squares and your characters have a movement stat that indicates how many of these squares they can move um, this can also vary depending on the terrain as this will affect different members centaurs especially uh, the movement is one of those little features that sets Shining Force apart from others because unlike other games when you have to go to the menu and select move this starts you in movement so when you go to the, your character turn you're already in the movement which makes it very quick uh, it's, it's one of those things that just, it just speeds up the gameplay um, and it also shows you the area you can move in which is always nice um, once you've done moving, you have multiple options, such as the most basic being attack, which compares your strength versus the enemy's defense, etc. Different weapons having different ranges. So if you've got a class that can do it, it's recommended having a couple of different weapons. The one for close combat, because they tend to be stronger, and then one for ranged, if you can't get into close combat. Um, you can also use magic, which acts very much like an attack, but could affect your party, your own party as well. Uh, when you attack, you're taken to a very swift alternative screen that shows your characters doing various animations for the attack and then your opponent's taking a hit or dodging, or vice versa. Uh, other options are the previously aforementioned magic, which can range from curative spells, buff debuffs to offensive spells, with various characters having different spells that they can learn. You can also use items or give items to allies in the range, um, which these both end your turn. But you can change your own character's equipment, so change your sword or axe or spear to lance, uh, which doesn't end your turn, which is nice. And then it's on to the next character. After an action, that character will usually gain some experience, which leads to the biggest RNG in the game, RNG being random number generation, um, which is leveling up. Every level up gives the chance to increase the character's stats by a small amount, larger numbers being more common after promotion. This could lead to your magic going up by 3 points, strength going up by 2, uh, HP going up, or your knight gaining a ton of HP. Um, but the RNG can lead it to be like, I've had in one run through a knight gain all of the HP under the sun, but no defence. So they have this massive hit points, but no defence to, to stop the damage. 
Um, I've had characters gain all the agility but no attack. Um, but yeah, this is just some of the fun sometimes. Is uh, how it is. It's part of the what makes the game different. But hey, as long as you don't get the level up where you don't get any stats at all, it's all good. Mm -hmm. Once the character gets level 10, it can go to try and promote, as I previously stated. An upgraded grass will generally gain more stats per level up. So instead of saying like 3 HP, they might suddenly gain 5 HP. Or I've had in cases where they've gained, instead of like normally on a level up, they'll get like 1 or 2 strength, they'll suddenly get 8 strength. So you start seeing their power, their power grow quickly. Um, what you have as well is with level ups is a lot of people have preferred promotion points. So some people like to promote at level 10 straight away, take that negative hit as early as possible and get those buffs early. Some people like to mid max as max as possible, wait till level 20 to promote, uh, get the maximum they can get from that pre-class and it, uh, suffer less and have higher stats overall. In the case of magic casters, it tends to be better to leave them later for promotion because they get their spells sooner. So it could be by getting to level 20 with your, your mage, they'll have all of their spells or, or a good chunk of them and then they promote. But if you did promote it early, you might still need to wait another 20, 30 levels to get all their spells. But overall, it's really reliant, leveling up is really reliant on random numbers. So it does make every run a bit different and makes every character a bit different every time. But you can have some really terrible runs. I've had one before, went back, the main character, got like two or three levels in a row with no stat upgrades, which sucks. Um, but yeah, overall, the battles tend to be on the quicker side than the counterparts, unless you're on a terrain heavy map which are really annoying. There's possibly one too many of those in this game. Um, it could be like, so like the the movement speed thing where you already start in the move state and it's very quickly the, the fact that it, the attack animations are quick or the enemy AI just gets its turn over and done with as quickly as possible. All, all add this to be a speedier game compared to some of the others. So battles tend to be 15, 20 minutes as opposed to, say, some of the battles in other games being half an hour to an hour. Um, it would be remiss of me, though, not to talk about the characters in the game, as we have such a variety. So the first people we meet are Max's friends, most of them being human, apart from the knights. The knights, being people instead of riding horses, are all actually centaurs. Um, so half human, half horse. We, also get, uh, we get several of these through the game, and they tend to be quite unique. So one of them might have a lot of HP, but no defense, high attack, but middling HP and defense, etc. There's also Birdmen, who can like fly and ignore all terrain. Uh, a walking tank armadillo, werewolf, samurai, ninja, floating strange magical creature, and even a hamster type thing. Some robots and dragons. Uh, I mean, that's quite a variety for a party as opposed to just having your generic classes. Uh, the amazing thing as well is they all actually feel very different to each other, even your knights. Like even though you have a bunch of them, they all do feel a bit different to each other. Especially when the random like numbers from levelling up come into play. It tends to set them all apart even more. Um, but yeah, on to my final thoughts. Uh, so after playing Shining Force for the time, this retrospective, I was hit with a couple of different things. Firstly, this game is still fantastic, even after all this time. And why more games didn't rip on Shining Forces format over Fire Emblem is something I'll never understand. I'm not saying I don't like Fire Emblem, I just like Shining Force more. <laughs> Secondly, the replayability uh, due to the sheer differences in the characters and the way they level up from the RNG is, is just mental. Like you, The game is never quite the same. I have loved, basically I've loved this game ever since I went to a richer friend's house who had this fancy Mega Drive set up and we were played Shining Force because that was the game we had. We played it up to the laser eye with, in like a single sitting, get our butts whooped to us because our simplistic child brains couldn't comprehend basic tactics at the time. Uh, just to show my complete bias, if anyone ever asks me what my favorite game is, I say Shining Force. So what I'd say for anyone who is vaguely a fan of strategy games or turn-based games 
or JRPGs or anything like that, then give this game a go. At least one of the Shining Force games, anyway. I'll admit, the game isn't perfect. No game is. The RNG can be an absolute nightmare. You can do your absolute best to have a perfect run, and then suddenly an enemy gets a double turn, or a critical, and that's it, game over. Uh, but with some understanding of this, you can usually mitigate it to some degree. It can still catch you out, though. And for some others, the story is not a sprawling political epic like a lot of the strategy games tend to be. But I think it's world building's great, story's good fun, and the characters are really interesting and varied. But yeah, I'm going to have to end it here before I just keep gushing about the game. So I think, get yeah, across that I love this game, and I think others should play it. And anyway, hopefully see you in the next video. Bye.